parents. I'll add that I'm a, I'm a former teacher of Clark County School District. So I led the ah. programming 22 years ago myself is how I came in touch with it. Lots of CCSD people probably on the call today. So um, this, this uh, screen here is just a quick peek, even if you haven't heard of the National Veterans Hall of Fame, um, we are partners with many schools and districts in the area. We serve both rural, urban settings, public schools, private schools, um, online schools, charters in both in-person virtual formats. And most of the partners that you see here on the screen participate in our summer program, which is called Camp Invention. And uh, we might touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. But I'd like to start this morning. We have a nice sized group and hopefully, we can encourage you guys to come off mute if you would and share a little bit with us because it'll be a lot more fun if we get a lot more inter or, um, interaction going. So let me pose this question for you. I'd like you to, without moving, without getting up at all, take a look at your immediate area, could be your desk, could be the table in front of you, and find one object, just one object that's easily accessible within reach and pick up that object, think about it for a minute, and then tell us or think about it, how that object best represents you. If that's too, that's too vague, then <laughs> stretch it into your, your teaching, your, your work as an educator, but just something that you can see in front of you that you might be able to um, find that rep, oh, I just saw a kitty. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To me, my kitties represent trying to balance um, my life as an educator with my personal life because they're very demanding. Yeah. You know, so when you're home, they help me be home because, you know, since my kids are, are grown now, the cats have kind of superseded them. So just they're. They really liked it when I was working from home last year. They thought it was the best thing ever, but uh, they just remind me to try and take time for myself as well. I hear you, Jenny. I'm in the same boat. I'm an empty nester now, um, and I have both a cat and a dog. And it's true. It's hard to separate. It's hard to cut your life, your work life off when your work life is your home. When when your work is in your home from your home. So I have a really hard time making that separation. But I always have those wonderful animals to remind me that they need to go out, they need to go for a walk, they need to be petted. And it's like, oh, so this is my boundary almost. And they are like children. They behave better than my children sometimes. So thank you for sharing. Anybody else have an object that's uh, interesting they would like to share with us? <gasps> yes, Terry, what have you got there? Well, you're on mute, Terry. I teach science uh, in seventh grade, so I, I'm always collecting stuff that interests me. Um, and a pine cone is readily available to anybody around Las Vegas, pretty much. Yep. And um, I guess it represents me because uh, there's so many of them, and I'm one of many, many people living in a community here. And each one of us is so intricate and interesting, just like this. The math teachers will recognize the Fibonacci pattern yep. Yep. Uh, in, in nature and the fact that there are seeds inside of all these little bits here, uh, which will engender brand new pine trees, uh, makes it, you know, really worthwhile, valuable um, part of the community. It's a lovely oh. analogy, Terry, on a lot of different levels. Um, it really conveys your observant, that you're a very observant person as well. So thank you for that. And I love that you have a pine cone on your desk. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? <laughs> anybody else? I don't see anybody's faces. Are you afraid to turn on your cameras today? No, yes, no, okay, all right. Well, do you have something for us, Lisa? No, just letting us see your face. That's nice, thank you. Um, all right, well, that is an experience um, that we like to use as an icebreaker. Sometimes on virtual sessions with children, um, we go on that little treasure hunt just because 
sometimes you get some really interesting answers and uh, it gives a lot of insight. Just a very small object can give a lot of insight into the mood of somebody on that particular day. So we use that a lot when we're working with children um, on virtual sessions and programs to kind of break the ice and get to know each other a little bit better. So if anything else strikes you and you want to jump in and you find a treasure, um, just let Annette know and we'll, we'll bring it back on. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, we really are in between so many worlds right now, like Kathy kind of said, conveyed and um, sometimes it's hard to realize the significance of that moment that we're in or that we've lived through, but we really are in this pivotal moment. And we believe that too, that, that we have arrived in a pivotal moment, not only in history, but in education. And we know that you've had to reimagine teaching and strategies to deliver education. We all have. So I think the thing that's interesting about this moment, it, it's that it's reminded us that challenges in the real world rarely have simple solutions, right? So everything that we face is, is fairly complex these days. And we feel strongly too that this is our opportunity to transform the way that kids and teachers work with each other and have this new relationship. And we believe at the National Inventors Hall of Fame, since that's our specialty, is that if we can foster this idea of inventive thinking not just as a side activity or a project or a, uh, a, a competition, but if we can make this idea of inventiveness integral with everything that we do during the school day, that we can really take advantage of this pivotal moment that we have and kind of reshape the idea of, of really great education. And again, we feel like, you know, I was looking at the headline of the conference today and we couldn't agree more with you that mindset does matter, right? Uh, mindset is really important. And now is the perfect time to realize this shift in instructional pedagogy. And we feel like it's a great time for invention education to flourish. So for the next few minutes together, we'd like to talk to you about the tenets of invention education. Maybe you have a, you know about it already, but maybe there are some things that you don't know that you could call upon to foster this mindset or continue to build this growth mindset and so forth that you're talking about with your students. So I wanna turn it back over to you now. And this is another interactive. So I hope you guys will kind of Get warmed up, turn your cameras on, um, think about this. Let's have some fun with it because the more that you share with all of us, it'll make this so much more fun and you'll learn so much more from each other than you ever would from me yakking at you. So here's a challenge for you. I want you to think about the most memorable learning experience you had um, as a kid, maybe in elementary school. You've probably been asked this before. So maybe it's that same activity, but I know I have one, it was a middle school activity. Um, everybody has one, but I'm gonna give you just 30 seconds to think about that really impactful learning experience. Maybe it was recently as an adult, whatever. So take 30 seconds and, um, oops, sorry, my timer just went off. And Jenny Davis has something to share. Oh, Jenny has a question. She has no, something to share. I was gonna share. <laughs> oh, good, go, go Jenny. Uh, like Terry, I'm also a science teacher. And if I think about it, probably my love for science started way young. And I don't necessarily know that it was a teacher as much as my dad that kind of turned me on to the wonders of nature. But I do remember in the fourth grade, we did the bug collection, you know, where you capture the bugs and you pin them. And I was kind of a- Ooh, yeah. Like, really I do cool. remember that now that you mentioned that. I didn't before. And we don't do that kind of thing anymore. No. We just don't do it, but uh, it was it was really a lot of fun to do. And uh, so when my my daughter was five and she's capturing insects to dissect them, I'm like, I don't know how you're going to dissect an insect, but darn if she didn't. <laughs> so I was like, and she's a scientist as well, so I'm excited for her. And then also uh, in this tenth grade and uh, in biology, I didn't really like my biology teacher. So apparently I said kind of under my breath, I could do a better job than this jerk. And my best friend heard me. And when we met at our class reunion, she's like, you're living your dream. Like, what are you talking about? 
She's like, do you remember in 10th grade when you said you could do a better job teaching biology than Mr. Stiggy? I'm like, oh yeah, I do remember saying that. I guess I am living my dream. I just needed a reminder, so. <laughs> right, I mean, sometimes you can have really bad role models and you turn out to be better at it than your bad role models. We talk about a lot about great role models, but sometimes you can learn a lot from the bad ones too. Is it Dare? Dare, is that my pronouncing your name right? Yes. yes. What's your favorite memory, Dare? So I was in sixth grade and we were doing social studies and we were studying different countries and we mm -hmm. all had to pick a different country. And I picked the country <gasps> of Chad because I had a brother named Chad. Oh. So we did those presentations where you um, bring in different things from their culture, including food. And then we had a a celebration of foods around the world. And each one of us did our presentation and told what our dish was. And then our families were there to watch and we had a celebration. And yeah. it really reminds me of what's going on in the world today because we're trying to celebrate everybody's unique culture and trying to give equity to everybody. Yeah, a voice, so. yep, that's cool. Way to go, Chad. I'm, I'm, I'm good thing he wasn't named. I mean, what if it would have been Zimbabwe or, or uh, <laughs> could have been anything, right? And now you know. Uh, I had no idea of how to pick a country. You know, yeah. I was so indecisive at that young age. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, what am I going to do? No, I and remember then, that one too when I was a kid. Um, and it was something about Central America. Oh, I know what it was. It was making a model of um, Machu Picchu with green sponges and paint and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Anybody else have a real, a real interesting kind of tangible memory? Okay. Well, thanks for those of you who did share. I think that's a lot more interesting to kind of um, see what you're thinking about. Um, and let me go back. I was gonna give us some time, but let me skip over that. So. I guess the next the let next extension of that conversation is why, right? Why was that? Oh, sorry, here we go. Why was that experience so memorable? Yes. And I, you know, I was going to throw out if we didn't have any interaction, I was going to say, well, remember the volcano, right? Remember the baking soda, uh, vinegar vault volcano. Or remember the molecule, remember the cell that we all did where we got to label the pieces and parts with edible items and then we got to eat it afterwards, right? I mean, how better way to memorize the mitochondria of a cell? Or what about the first time you learned to play chess, maybe in an after school setting? Or remember this one where we all got to put the bean, or sprout a bean from an individual seed and watch it grow in the window and apply the variables of light and water and temperature and recorded those and, and, and watch something really grow from a seed. I mean, that's a really neat one too. For many of us, it's a sports activity um, where we just have that real lasting memory of a coach. Um, so, so again, why? What is it about those experiences that really, they're unforgettable. We can think back and they just pop back into our mind. And so obviously, it's generally because they're so tactile, right? So you've had a lot of experiences that, that really involve more than one of your senses. The food from Chad is a perfect example. Um, that kind of stuff stays with you, the smells. Um, so generally those experiences are very tangible. Sometimes it's the, um, it's the way that it was presented to you. Like it was usually pretty open-ended, like you had the control over how you designed your experiment or more likely, like in, in um, Dara's case, you chose the topic you wanted to learn more about. So you had that control over your learning. Um, maybe it was this idea of making a difference. So it might've been an experience that resonated with you because you were one of those kids that was concerned and empathetic and you really wanted to do something for, for, for the better. So it had an impact on either the world or on people or you solved someone's problem. Um, maybe it was about working with another kid. Maybe you and your friend, you made that diorama with a friend and you'll never forget sitting on the floor, putting the planets in the box and cuddle, coloring with glitter because you're doing it with a friend and it was so much more impactful. Or maybe it was a team of, of people. And it was probably involved an adult that 
that really encouraged you? There was probably some really great, or in a, in uh, the other case, maybe a bad teacher, but I'm, I was always thinking it in terms of a really encouraging teacher that really created that safe space for you to explore and tinker. And probably there wasn't a lot of consequence in terms of, I got to get this right because there's a test on it. So there wasn't that fear of, this is going to, I'm going to probably get this wrong, right? So um, at the National Inventors Hall of Fame, we, we strongly believe that engaging learning is all of that. It's learning that lasts a lifetime. It's always hands-on. It's always collaborative. It's very often playful. And um, the challenge, of course, is how do you create that vibe, that setting, that space virtually um, or in disrupted settings where you can really have that learning continue to happen? Um, well, that's what we're going to hear to talk about today. And just a little bit of background, if you don't know us or you've never heard of us, um, just a couple of things about us. We're a national nonprofit. We are in partnership with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And we bring invention to life in a couple of ways. The picture on the screen that you see here is our actual museum. So our museum is a walk-in museum. It's located in the atrium of this beautiful building at the United States Patent and Trademark Head Office. That's in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you're ever in the DC area and you wanna go over the river and, and visit this museum, it's free, it's really interactive. It's um, kind of off the beaten path. Um, so that's our museum. And then the museum um, is static, but every year we induct a new group of inductees into our Hall of Fame. And this slide shows you how we sort of foster invention education from really from cradle to career. Um, the, the gentleman on the right is an inductee into the Hall of Fame. Each year we induct a new class of world change in inventors. Surprisingly, most people don't know who they are. It, it's the kind of, they're the kind of unsung heroes that we couldn't live without their technology. They've made tremendous um, impacts to our daily lives, to our health and our welfare. And um, so we couldn't really live without their inventions, but really nobody knows the, his, the story behind them. So part of our mission is to really um, honor and respect and share the stories of these people because we want the world to be filled with more of people like them, right? We want more problem solvers in the world. Um, the center section here, these are our collegiate inventors. They are the best and the brightest in colleges right now working on groundbreaking, ground changing invention so they can um, compete in a competition. And finally, of course, the most important piece are the children that we impact through the stories and the educational curriculum and programs that we write every year. So that's our kind of continuum. And over the years of working with these people and, and talking to them and asking them about how they invented, how they approached the invention process, what their early education experiences were. I just asked you what yours were. Well, our education team talks to these physicists and these, um, <coughs> excuse me, these scientists and really tries to pick their brain because what is that secret sauce? If you could get into the minds of these people and recreate it and inspire kids in a classroom, how would you do that? And you know, we've learned over the years, decades really, of talking to these people that they have certain things in common. They really do have common characteristics and traits that have empowered them and will in turn, we feel empower children. So we've tried to take all of the elements that have bubbled to the top of their conversations that have this thread of commonality and say, oh, all right, well, we need to, we need to do a, we need to build our curriculum and our program that, that helps build confidence for children, that, that fosters this idea of persistence, that, um, that gives them a framework. So like a design thinking framework that they can really follow as a roadmap, sorry, hit the wrong button. So they can use design thinking as a roadmap and go step by step by step in the invention process. All of our programs are based on STEM, just because all of our inductees in the Hall of Fame have science backgrounds, they may be biologists, they may be physicists, they may be math, maybe engineering, technology, but they all have that STEM discipline. But there's so much more to being a creative problem solver and a successful inventor than just having the discipline. You have to have all of these other elements and be able to collaborate and work with teams. 
So that's really the type of individual we're looking for is how do they do that? How do they work well with each other? Um, and so that's the innovation mindset that we call. We call it an innovation mindset um, from talking to these inventors over the years. And the key concepts that guide our lessons are that we feel strongly that children learn by being creative, obviously by solving problems, scaffolding on their existing knowledge and experience and having fun. And all this leads to a really authentic way of learning. So it's authentic if you own it, if you've decided upon it, if you've established the problem that you're going after. So that's very important to us and guides all of our work. So I'm almost through here talking and I'm gonna have another activity coming up for you, but let me finish off by saying that invention education really becomes really easy to integrate into any STEM or STEAM session or teaching and learning. And it really does do this. It really does um, work in any environment. It's interesting in, in, in person, it's interesting virtually. And the key really is that it allows children become, to become protagonists in their own learning. So in other words, um, they learn by following their innate curiosity as problem solvers. Um, and it really shows them that their ideas have value. So not just intangible, tangible value, but intangible value. And that value is called intellectual property. So remember I said we're partnered with the, National, the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office. Well, that institution is very important because it's a, it's a key component of our economic system. And it's a, we want children to know and understand from an early age that if they have an idea, it's very valuable and it's very important that they know how to protect their intellectual property. So we do that in this country through patents and copyrights and trademarks. And it's everywhere. Anytime you get a job in any corporation or business or nonprofit, you're going to be introduced to these concepts. So we feel like even at a very young age, it's really important to talk about this idea of intellectual property. And of course, the Patent Trademark Office wants to have more patent holding um, people in the, in the um, pipeline. So we've also found that invention education, of course, by, by presenting in this this mindset, it does a lot to bolster social emotional skills, as you can imagine, and really has helped children regain a lot of the confidence that they've lost over the past 18 months. Um, so, you know, you'll probably recall that your favorite learning experience, um, when you overcame that challenge, it was really empowering for you because you kind of did it on your own and, and maybe you realized that, oh, wow, um, the best example is, you know, the science, the uh, biology teacher that the friend says, you know, you can do this better than the teacher. And it's like that aha moment where you think, oh, yeah, I can, I can do that. And I really do have these abilities and these characteristics that are important. So it's when these kids arrive at these aha moments through the confidence of solving their own problems that invention education really has a powerful impact. All right, let's get to another one. Let's have you do this exercise. And I'd like you to write down three things that you needed to attend this virtual session. And I do have a clock here, it's 30 seconds. Three things that were absolutely imperative. You couldn't be here right now unless you had these things, okay? <laughs> I'm going to go to the chat now and hope I see a billion responses. Let's see. Oh, I do. Good, 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 good. Oh, my goodness. You need your computer. You need your home. Uh, you need time. You need the link. You need the Chromebook. 
you need Wi-Fi, curiosity, love that. Um, you need some free time, well, I can't help you there. Um, you need the internet access, link to the summit, device, Zoom, lots of technology. Yep, 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 T lots of technology. So glad you said that. Um, the technology, I think, yeah, that's because of where we are, of course, but um, would have been interesting to, to, to ask that question in, a, in, a, in an in-person scenario too, that would have generated a lot different answers. But I kind of figured that you, some of the answers would be um, technology. So laptops, some kind of connectivity, whether Wi-Fi or some kind of internet protocol. And all of those items, you know, because we have that, we have an, we have an inventor to thank for all of those devices. And, and these are a few inventors that are in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And I highlight them because we're so proud. This is this 2022 class of inductees. And if you don't know Marion Croke, you should get to know her. She is an incredible role model. She works for Google right now in their artificial intelligence area. And she is the first, for the first year ever, we have two African-American women inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. So Marion Croke is one of them. Patricia Bath is the second. Patricia Bath is an ophthalmologist and helped invent uh, laser surgery, eye surgery. So definitely look at Marion's story. She's phenomenal. We also love Radia Perlman. Radia lives in um, Redmond, Washington, and she invented robust network routing and bridging. Radia is a, is a brilliant mathematician, MIT trained computer scientist. Radia is also a brilliant musician. So she has the ability in her mind to look at the notes on a page and kind of create an analogy of, of music as a form of a way of networking and communication. So she's a phenomenally interesting woman, also has an interesting background. She's a trailblazer because she was the only woman in these classes in, at MIT you know, 30 years ago. There just weren't any. So she has a, a really interesting story. So look her up if you want to. And of course, the most um, iconic probably is when you think about Apple, or you think about the computer, it's Steve Jobs. So these are just three inductees in the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and we have over 500. So this would be an interesting, we think, an interesting project for students to learn more about and research inventors and who are patent holding and happen to be in this Hall of Fame. So the way to do that is to go to our museum webpage or our, our actual, our, our webpage, I'll give you that in the chat. Um, and maybe just Annette, why don't you jot down invent.org in the chat. And we have our museum on the Google Arts and um, Culture platform. So, you know, Terry's nodding her head. Google Arts and Culture is a phenomenal database unbelievable museums all around the world. If you don't use Google Arts and, and culture, you definitely should. Culture is a key word there because you'll be introduced, your kids will be introduced to all kinds of exhibits and music and it's just lovely, it's phenomenal. And of course it's Google, so you know nothing they do is gonna be small, it's a big deal. So that's where our museum is housed on that platform. So you go to the Google Arts and platform, culture platform, put National Inventors Hall of Fame in the search bar, and you can take a tour of our, of our field, of our um, museum. And um, bonus points if anybody can remember where our museum is physically housed. Annette, put, watch the chat for me, Annette, and we're gonna give out bonus points for where this building actually lives. Um, but they'll, you'll find interesting stories. And this is the kind of thing, if we can inspire a kid that says, oh my goodness, somebody invented the super soaker. Um, by the way, um, Lonnie Johnson was inducted in this year's class as well. And, and while you might not think of the super soaker as kind of the same kind of phenomenal change to the world as say the COVID vaccine, Lonnie Johnson again has a phenomenal story as an entrepreneur, as a philanthropist. Um, so it, he's, you know, again, it's a really great story to, to read about. And like, these are platforms, right? For kids to launch, for curious children to launch um, ideas and launch and take interest in and maybe do research projects and reports about. So other ways we want to leave you today with some immediate ways that are very easy to bring 
some elements of invention, invention education into your students' um, classrooms, wherever those may be. And the first thing, of course, is to go to our website and click on our at-home learning resources. You'll find a STEM handbook that is full of, um, a lot of these can be done at home with family. That, so you can start them in a school setting, online setting, and then have them finish them at home with family members. Um, and I'd like to show you one of these activities and then we'll kind of point out some key points about it. But first I'd like to talk about materials. Um, we use a lot of upcycle materials as you may as well because they don't have to be expensive. And if you wanna talk about being um, equitable, this is a great way to do it because it doesn't create a barrier. So we rely on recycled materials. Um, so you don't have to buy anything, kits or technology and clay, cardboard tape, all these things are really good for prototyping um, inventions. And we talk about them as, as trying to make your thinking visible. We do a, sometimes we do an icebreaker again over a Zoom session where we have everybody take just a piece of clay. And if had we been able to send you materials, we would have done this and pull out that piece of clay and warm it up in your hand and form um, a representation of the last thing you read. So think about the last thing you read, whether it was a book, whether a newspaper article, whatever, and um, fashion that idea into clay and share that out. Phenomenal way to make your thinking visible. So easy, but so, so again, it's empowering because you're, you're, you're asked to what your opinion is. What are you thinking about? Who are you? And to be able to represent that, not just in words, but in an object really makes you feel good. So Anyway, that's what we know about materials. They don't have to be expensive. And then they're also really authentic. This is one of my favorite inductees in the Hall of Fame. Forrest Bird lives up in North, well, he's passed now, but he lived up in North Idaho in a very remote place in North Idaho um, on a big airstrip. He was a very um, famous aviator. He flew for General Patent, um, flew all kinds of seaplanes and helicopters. He has a museum of all these old planes. He has an old iron lung machine in his museum, but he was um, interested in figuring out how to breathe at high levels of altitude. And then his wife also had a very serious case of emphysema. So he was trying to figure out a way to help her breathe better. And as a result, um, kind of tinkered around and invented ultimately this respirator ventilator, but he also made it small because at the time there wasn't a, a version of the respirator that could accommodate the size of a child or a baby. So when children at that, those small ages, um, they just, there wasn't really that much they could do to help them. So this invention was world changing for parents of small children and children. And he did his, his initial prototype, honestly, this is a true story, made out of strawberry shortcake tins and a doorknob. Went to the, he went to the um, hardware store and bought those sort of, and, and, and in his museum, if you look up his museum up in Sagal, Idaho, you can see the trajectory of his prototyping. Starts with the doorknob and duct tape and then ultimately evolves into this final um, device. And this one actually, he, he, the first one he made was actually see-through he thought if people could see the inner workings of mechanical devices, they would better understand, be better to easier to use them, fix them and apply them. So talk about making thinking visible. And in our world today, when children see this kind of a device, they don't have any clue, nor will they ever have any clue by looking at it, how it works. You can't take it apart. There's nothing to see. You can't see the mechanical workings. You can't see the chips. So this idea, again, of invention education where you can take things apart and physically watch gears change and look at a capacitor and maybe see a spark, maybe see a light bulb uh, flicker on as a result of having the circuit connected to it. That's really a great experience. And back in the day when Annette and I were much younger and there weren't as many um, laws, um, we had children bring in broken appliances to our camps in the summer and let them take them apart and provided them with the tools and so forth. And it was one of the most fun and, and, and uh, interesting activities that we ever did. Um, but then the world kind of changed and it got a little more tricky to bring those into a classroom. So then we still have that remnant though of reverse engineering. So we'll usually provide kids with something. It can be even like a toy. 
So if your kids have an old toy in the bedroom and it has some screws where you can literally unscrew them, not have to break apart hard plastic, but if they have screws and take things apart, that's a super fun thing to do. And you can even do it over, uh, over a Zoom session by sort of helping um, kids through that process. So that was just a little bit about um, some of the ideas of prototyping and why materials, it's so easy to do that with inexpensive materials. So this is a quote from a school district administrator. And in order for kids to even show up for remote learning, the activities have to be a lot more than engaging than what often happens in the classroom. So really, I think that is the challenge. And, and, and our teachers a lot were using project-based learning in their classrooms, but kind of quickly found that it was a lot harder to do it remotely had to be a lot more clever. You had to be a lot more animated. You had to be a lot more creative. And so one of the things we'll like to do is send you a white paper and follow up called um, Implementing Project-Based Learning in Distance Environments um, to kind of give you some clues, maybe some, um, some ideas on how we see it done successfully. And of course, most of the success that teachers report are always due to this idea of trying to give students as much voice and choice and agency in their learning, just like we talked about before. And we love this quote by John Dewey that uh, really successful learning is grounded in experience and driven by student interest. So um, we do that as much as we can, even in remote settings. And we have a whole wealth of data spaces of white papers and blog posts that we'll share out with you that you can look at later to hopefully give you some ideas on how to do that. Um, one of those things we do too is um, seasonality is important. So linking activities to the time of year. We've got some really cool activities and blog posts. This is one of our favorite for Halloween. Um, and the conversations that you can have here are limitless with physics and distance and um, weight and mass. And yet it's just really, really fun too. The other thing we like to use all the time and I'm sure you do as well is, is really focus on these open-ended questions. Um, I wish I had a blank that could blank is, is one of our main introductory quotes or, or sentences for a child that starts them on this idea of wish I had, what is my problem? And I wish I had a, something that could solve that problem. And sometimes kids need a little bit more um, inspiration. Sometimes you can't always just start with a blank slate. So let me show you um, one of the activities that you'll find in our STEM handbook and, and some of the things to watch for. So this is a simple activity called, what if you could clean your entire room um, without moving from one spot? Let nature be an inspiration as you dream up sketch and prototype the ultimate room cleaning robot. Okay, so, so this is an interesting, fun activity. Maybe you've done it before, maybe they um, maybe haven't. But a couple of things I'd like to point out um, that's unique. So again, here we have this open-ended what if question always, always starts with this or what if or how can or um, so forth. Um, inspiration here. In invention education, um, we use, and Terry mentioned it right away. Uh, she didn't mention it, but I think she, was, she implied it that we use biomimetics or biomimicry in a lot of our invention education because that's what real inventors tell us they do. So we always look to inspiration from nature to solve a problem. And biomimicry is a phenomenal thing in and of itself. And so um, we're asking the kids to look at nature. We're asking them to sketch and then prototype. So that's where the design thinking process comes in. The design thinking process starts with an ideation phase then a sketch phase, um, then prototyping. And in our world, we go with uh, protecting it, get a patent on it. And then, and then the entrepreneur piece comes in, scaling it out and forming a business. So a lot's going on in this little activity that uh, on the surface may not, may not look like that much. Here are simple materials, nothing too complex, something, things that can be traded out easily or substituted. And then Brainstorming is always the prelude to a really successful invention session. So if you can hold a successful brainstorming session, we have rules and tools that we do it in our program. Things like, what do I do when a kid gets stuck? How do I handle the, you know, keep it on an upbeat level? How do we take turns? How do we build successfully on one another's ideas? So 
we've developed a pretty interesting structure to do that. And it gets better as you practice it. Um, so we always start with a brainstorming session. And then finally, what are we learning here? Well, first of all, this idea of inspiration. Um, you know, if you think about um, solving nature solving problems, the obvious one is the Velcro story, right? Have, have you all heard of the Velcro story? Um, Velcro was invented by a Swiss person by George Damas Drahl, and he's in our National Inventors Hall of Fame. So if I was really curious, I would go to our web link and I would look up Mr. Mistral and I would read his story. But he was a Swiss mountaineer. And he, did, he found that when he was out hiking in the mountains, he would come home and his dog and his sweater would be covered with these not these nuisance burrs and he would pick them off his his socks and his dog and and he decided well this is they are so annoying but maybe there's a purpose too what makes them so annoying how do they stick how is this happening and he put them under a microscope and he's he found the hook and the attachment uh, of literally what that burr looked like under a microscope so that was his inspiration for the fabric um, of velcro and that is, like I say, it's a classic one. Um, and it, it resulted in million dollar business. I mean, you could tell the whole same story with a zipper. I think we have the inductee in the Hall of Fame who invented the zipper. You can think about it on the winglets of an airplane that were inspired by birds. Um, you can think about it in terms of a swimsuit. Like when you watch the Olympics and you see those swimsuits that are patterned after shark skin. Well, there's a reason for that, for the, art, for the aerodynamic nature of those. Um, so uh, this activity really focuses on um, biomimicry as well. Does anybody else have any interesting that they love nature that solved a problem? Any example of a lesson that they've used with biomimetics? I've read about um, an MIT uh, study for delivery of insulin that would overcome the problem of um, not having it, not having the uh, medicine make it through the stomach system or you know stomach aspect of digestion. Mm -hmm. They copied um, a, t a type of turtle that automatically writes itself, and their design of this little delivery thing. I can't remember if the person ingests it. I think that was it. And it would automatically write itself in the stomach and attach to what it needed to attach to and deliver the insulin. So these poor people wouldn't have to be jabbing themselves constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is amazing how many yeah. medical um, inventions and um, uh, medicine, medicines that have been developed um, and even like radio, where she was, it was a technology that she was trying to um, figure out. So it's, it, it really is, it's, um, it's ubiquitous, this idea of, and what it really takes. So how do you do that? Well, the inductees tell us that you have to be extraordinarily observant. You have to be able to not be distracted. So again, the world that we're living in now where we all have a, what, a three minute attention span, the more we can promote this idea of just stopping and thinking and observing is going to be a lot, we're gonna all be a lot better off. So I only have a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna finish up by saying, um, we're going to share some links for more blogs, more white papers, more resources that can help you. We have printables, so you can go on our website and download stories of inductees that would be fun for kids to kind of, um, not that we want to do a lot of handouts and, and paperwork and, and spread and um, worksheets, that's not who we are, but again, it's nice to have some inspiration, so if you want to learn about George Alcorn or um, some of our Jim West, who invented the electric microphone, this is a fun way to kind of get started. So we're going to send you those. We have some challenges that are fun for kids. Again, not it's not the idea of doing the, the, the paper and so forth, but it's more about inspiring them to want to learn more. And I'm going to finish off today, probably go a minute too long, with our one of our favorite inventors, Jackie Quinn. She's a NASA scientist 
who was tired of seeing the groundwater completely trashed when rockets were launched with toxic materials. So she figured out a way to, to remove that toxic waste from um, groundwater. Here's her story. I wonder whether I can provide some sort of catalyst for making our planet a better place upon which to live. As an innovator, I'll start out with attacking a problem going, I wonder if, and I think just that questioning, that I wonder statement is the best way to open up your innovation portal. Both of my parents were science educators. I think that when I look at me and the opportunities I had and what I was eventually going to become really didn't have any other option than to go into science because I had such great role models. Being raised with a family that always wanted to be out experiencing the wonders of nature started it off. I started out as a new hire. I came and worked on the shuttle program. And for a couple years, I worked on different shuttles, preparing them for spaceflight. And that in itself is a really awe-inspiring adventure. I had an opportunity to switch gears and start moving into a field that allowed me to begin restoration of contaminated groundwater. Groundwater contamination is certainly a global problem. EZBI stands for Emulsified Zero Valent Iron, and it is an emulsion and water system used to degrade contamination in the subsurface in your groundwater. I've been extremely fortunate to work with some amazing scientists and researchers here at the Kennedy Space Center and, and also at the university. Without them, you know, we would not have developed these technologies because team settings create some of the most prosperous and, and productive environments. EZBI is one of the most licensed technology for NASA to date. Most people think of NASA as having space and aerospace and up and out, and one of the technologies that's been licensed the most is actually one that's literally down and in. I think it's neat to kind of be part of that first mission that goes and looks for those first sets of resources that may enable that further human exploration past the moon, on to Mars and beyond. I wonder what it's going to be like in 50 years to live on another planetary body. I wonder, I wonder what it's going to take to get us there. So there you go, everyone. Thank you. I think we're at time. I'm, we're, Ned and I are happy to hang out if you want to. Um, uh, I haven't looked at the chat, but if you want to ask us some more questions, um, you know, feel free. Otherwise, we really thank you for your attendance and hope you have a phenomenal weekend. Thank you, Christine and Annette. Um, you. you guys, just a few things I put in the chat area is the attendance. I'll put that link in there again. Uh, just a reminder also that um, lunch is from now until about 11.55. And then make sure you go back into the, um, where you see all the different sessions and refresh your page because there's been some updates to the sessions for session three and four. And um, that's it. Um, if you guys have any questions, let us know. Otherwise, go have a great lunch and we'll see you back in the um, back in a room or any room that you choose to go to at 1155. All right. Thanks, Kathy, for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you Thanks so much. I threw up that attendance leak again for anybody who needs it. Thank you so much. It really was wonderful. I can't wait to uh, dive into the materials. I've been looking at the open sci uh, that our district 